If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 34, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Deuteronomy chapter 34, in the very first verse. The Bible says, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab, unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the lands of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south sea, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm tree, the city of palm trees on the Zor. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. <coughs> so Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses was ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there, and there arose not a prophet, a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew Amen. face to face. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for an opportunity to be in your house today. Lord God, we thank you... Uh, for putting things in such a way that we might attend and might be here and might uh, commune with your people. Lord, this morning we pray that you would give us strength and mercy and that we could set aside every uh, idle thought, things that have no uh, eternal value, but we would be able to focus in on you this morning and that you would uh, guide us by the Holy Ghost this morning that we might understand and know uh, your word more clearly. Bless it to the hearts of the people. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I'll be preaching this morning on how do you know God. Now the Bible is very clear here that uh, the Lord knew, uh, Moses knew the Lord face to face. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I think that we know God from a very distant standpoint. If you've ever been saved, truly redeemed, at least at one point you knew Him briefly. And I don't mean that you can quit knowing Him and being lost, but uh, you can know Him more and more as the years and time progress. But most of us choose not to. And I did say choose, because if we want to, we can. Now, in the whole building this morning, I know Donna the best. We key in, we're face to face. I, I know things about her that even her mother and daddy know, and they might know things I don't know. But anyway, I know her face to face. It has to be an intimate relationship. It has to be something that go goes beyond Sunday morning. It has to be something that goes beyond the routine to know the Lord God face to face. And I dare say most never do. Most people have a very shallow relationship with the Lord. And if you don't think that it's possible to experience a shallow relationship uh, with the Lord, uh, uh, think about um, uh, Ahab. Ahab knew the Lord, but he had a very shallow relationship with him. Now, in the first verse, the Bible says, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah. Now, uh, all through his life, time and time again, Moses displayed himself 
to have an interest in the things of God even when it impacted him in a negative way physically. In other words, a physical effort was put out. Now, we live in a day and age today where most will tell you, hey, it's just a spiritual thing, nothing physical is required. Well, that's a funny thing to me because fasting is hard on the flesh and we're told to fast. And so, yes, it will impact your flesh. And if you really want to be in tune with the Lord, you know what? It's going to take some physical effort, too. You're going to have to give up some things. You're going to have to dedicate a, a chunk of time unto the Lord if you, really, if you really want to do this. So we find Moses uh, abiding in these plains. And he comes up Moab. And then he goes a little further and even climbs up Pisgah all because God told him to. Now, what would you do if God told you to do something? <coughs> would you be willing to go to a specific location such as the top of Pisgah just because God told you to? Just because that was what he commanded? And certainly that's what we as the Lord's people ought to have a willing heart to do. But many times we don't. And what suffers is the closeness to God. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab into the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. Now I want you to I, I want to make one quick comment about Jericho, that the place that he positioned him, he says, I want you in this spot was very, very near unto the enemy. Now, many times the Lord is going to put you in situations where you're very, very close to trouble. And the re there, there's a couple reasons by that. One thing, you'll learn to depend on Him more. And the other thing is this, maybe uh, you'll, learn, you'll learn to know what sin looks like. And you can avoid it a little bit more. And so he gets to the, the very best position, at least for Moses, was very near Jericho, which was a, a very, very sinful city. And that's where he placed him. Now also, I want you to see that he shows him all the land. And it is, uh, it is divided into territories. Uh, each tribe got a certain amount and a certain portion of land. Now, how did Moses know that? How did he see it? You know, from the top of Pisgah, you can't see all of that. You know, uh, over in East Tennessee, uh, close to Chattanooga, there's Lookout Mountain, in which you're supposed to be able to see seven states, or parts of seven states. And, and so, but that's not necessarily so in, in viewing all of Israel, especially as you go further up. And, you know, it makes me wonder, did he take him and say, this is their section, and this is their section? Because otherwise, how would have Moses ever known it? I don't know, and maybe he just knew by looking, but I'm just saying this. There's very special things for those that go with God. There's special knowledge, there's special understanding, there's special blessings for those that go with God. And I'll say this on the flip side, if you choose not to go with God, you'll starve to death on the vine. And so he shows them how it's broken into tribes. Now, in verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. Now, I want you to see that it had been a long, long time coming. But what did he go back to? The promises that he made to Abraham. You know what? Uh, we've been waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to return for a long time. Right. But just because he hasn't, doesn't mean he won't. And, and you know what? It came to fulfillment. None of those men seen it. In fact, by this point, we're some 400 years down the track. And finally, the promises is fulfilled. And you know what? We'll see them too. We'll see the promises fulfilled one day. It's just being patient. And, and so, by going to the top of the mountain, he saw, he saw, the, he saw the, the promise fulfilled. Now, let me say this. 
It wasn't very long until sin came in and they had another 40 years to wander around. And, and you know what? When we, see the, when we see the great things of God, you beware because sin is going to be at the door and sin is going to come in. Verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Now, if you don't get nothing else out of this sermon this morning, you get how Moses died according to the word of the Lord. You know what? You're going to find in a second that his physical condition was fine, but he died according to the word of the Lord. You know how you're going to die? According to the word of the Lord. You know how I'm going to die? According to the word of the Lord. And you know what? This is the blessed truth. I won't die until then. And then if it is time, a team of Vanderbilt physicians can't preserve my life one minute longer because I'll die according to the word. Of the Lord. Uh, and you know what? That ought to make us very mindful that our time here is precious and soon gone. Verse 6 And he, meaning God, buried him in a, in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Now I believe it may be. In the book of Jeremiah, I'm not sure about that. Maybe it's in the New Testament. But you remember, uh, Satan had a dispute concerning the body of Moses. And the reason why, he wanted to lead him back out into the wilderness. He didn't want this victory to come. And uh, because of that, nobody even knows where his, his, his grave is till today. Um, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a shaky thing. When you think that Satan wanted to incarnate Moses' body. And uh, don't think those things are just a thing of the past. It's still, it, it's still a possibility. Verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. And his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Now, what that means, he was just as fit as he'd ever been. He, he, he didn't have any of the affirmities of old age. He didn't hurt. There was, you know, uh, I've never seen a 120-year-old person, but I've seen a 110-year-old person uh, many years ago. And you know what? They weren't finished fiddle. They weren't ready to go. But I want you to see that Moses died in full good health despite his age. You know why, you're, you know why your uh, health fails you? This is not popular preaching because God wants it that way. Everybody blames sin, right? But you know why your health fails? Because God wants it that way. Pretty, pretty bizarre truth, ain't it? Because you have to look at it like this. If Moses' health was sustained by God, whose health fails? By God, right? And, and, and so we don't need to get stressed when we get a little sick and we get a little infirmities of old age and a little bit of difficulty. We just need to understand and know that that too is authored by God. Verse 8, And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of, the, of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Don't keep the boo-hoos. Don't, don't keep, you know what? They, they give him respectful time and then they moved on. You know what? The worst thing that a person, a nation, a family can do is worship somebody in the flesh. And listen, you don't have to do all this to be worshiping somebody in the flesh. You can take their opinion above that book in your lap this morning. And well, you know what you've done? You've worshiped. See, it doesn't matter how good Aunt Sally and Uncle Jim were. Listen, they don't they don't go above that book in your life. In your life, if they if they are teaching something contrary that that book don't uh, back up, you know that that you should go with God. Amen. Go with what the Word of God teaches, and uh, you'll be fine <laughs> as long as you do that. And so we see that uh, they moved on. Verse 9, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the Spirit 
of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. Now that's a that's something that's a New Testament truth, is it not? All right. Uh, you know, you know what he was doing. He he was being ordained. He he was he was passing he was passing it on to him, and that's exactly what uh, the the Lord's people ought to do. They they had a new leader, and not only did they have a new leader, they accepted his leadership. They didn't get upset about it. They didn't get mad about it. They accepted for who he was. Verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, how well do you know the Lord? Verse 11. And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent to do in, e in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. You know how he got to know him? By experience. Now, if the Lord's told you to throw your walking stick down and it was going to be a snake, would you believe him? I dare say most of us wouldn't. Right? You know, when I was a kid, people don't say this much anymore. Well, that was just in the Old Testament. Why? Does it change? Does his powers abate? Certainly not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, that, that first throwing down of the rod was a very was a very uh, beginning of him trusting God to the point of calling down uh, from calling down frogs and and calling and causing the rivers to turn into blood and uh, the plagues of flies. You know, with each one, I believe he trusted God more. And I believe what it takes today for us as the Lord's people is it, it just trust him at his word and keep trusting him. You know what he said. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Believe that. Trust him. But you know what? You may have to go through some things to trust him. You may have to, you know, you know how you learn to trust him? By experience. By going through something, and when you get out on the other side, then you know that you've learned to trust him. And so we find that none trusted him, none knew him like he did. And in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses shewed in sight of all Israel. How well do you know it? Go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 3. Very familiar verses of Scripture. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now, how do you get there? Why was Moses where he was at? Because he killed a soldier, and they knew it, and he ran for all his life. You know what? Uh, that's a pretty sinful act, just to kill somebody. You know what? I, I don't. I, I've thought a lot about it. Unless maybe interfering, you know, threatening my family, I don't know that I could kill someone. I really don't. You know what? I, I think I could if they were bothering my children or my grandchildren or Donna. I think I could. But you know what? It's a very, very serious thing to kill somebody. And you know what? Moses had done that. Moses had killed somebody. And when you really study the story of the murder, and it was a murder, it wasn't that big a deal, all things considered. You see what I'm saying? What He, he saw a Jew being mistreated, and it made him so angry that he killed someone. You know what? You better watch your temper. You know what? I don't think he was justified in killing that man. 
I really don't. I don't think he had any righteousness, no what's, uh, none whatsoever. I don't think it was a, a moral thing to do. I don't think he, he was doing the right thing. He killed a man. And because he killed a man, you know what? Sin will drive you from God. Now, I personally don't think he was saved when he did it. A lot of people may disagree with me. I do not think Moses was saved until the occasion we're reading of. I think he was religious. I think he had some religion. He, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. And he understood the law. And he understood what they had been given. But you know what? That don't make you saved. You, you know what the best evidence of redemption is? Do you crave the things of God? And if you don't, something's terribly wrong. Something's terribly wrong. And, and so then we find that now as a murderer in a different land, and I'll give you another piece that I think he was lost. He married an infidel. His wives, neither one of his wives were believers. They may have became believers, but Jethro was an idolater. And so we see then that we, uh, we, we must take the circumstance for what it is. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. Now, I want you to see God appeared to Moses and not the other way around. Verse 4, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God said unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now, if he already knew God, why did God have to introduce himself? You see what I'm saying? One thing that's key to salvation this morning, has God ever introduced himself? Because see, way too often, <laughs> what we're trusting is us introducing ourselves to God. Have you ever thought about anything so stupid? <laughs> You think God don't know you exist? <laughs> but the, the thing is, has He introduced Himself to you? Has He manifested Himself to you? Because really it doesn't matter that you know about God. Now, get what I said, that you know about God. You know, it's good to know some Bible truth, but I really don't care about that. What, I, what I'd like you to know this morning, do you know God? Do you know Him in an intimate relationship? Do you know Him as, as Moses said here, do you know Him face to face? Because see, if you lack that this morning, you well could be lost. You see what I'm saying? If you like that intimacy, and I'll even go a step further, if that intimacy is not important to you, you may not know God. And so we find that here he was introduced to God. Go with me to Numbers. Now you know time and time again there were problems in the scene. And that made... <laughs> Moses know God more and more. Numbers 21. Uh, and we'll begin in the very first verse. Numbers 21 in the first verse. And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by way of the spies, he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. There's going to be problems. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. 
Now, I want you to see that there was a great victory and people were delivered. You, you know what's lacking today in, among God's people? And in, in fact, is this is a great victory. But I want you to see what preceded the great victory was some of them being in, in bondage. Some of them being taken captive by this king. They were locked up. You, you know when the greatest faith came to Paul and Silas? When they was locked up. See, uh, we've had it way too easy, way too long. If you, if you don't believe that, just follow the Bible. And, and so because they trusted God, He gave them a great and glorious victory. Because He, he, he delivered them, they, they enjoyed it. Uh, they enjoyed it in a great way. Verse 4, And they journeyed uh, from Mount Hor. Now they had rescued the people. And they journeyed, journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. Now I want you to... Uh, to get that, that compass because it's a war term. It's, it's a battle term. And, and they, they were going to compass that city and take Edom as well. They, they were in the mind of victory. I ask you that. You know, uh, Moses was always in the mind of victory, but his people didn't always follow him. See, you, you know what's wrong with the Lord's churches today? I can tell you, they're in the mind of defeat. What did the Lord promise the church? On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? And I believe that's true. But He also said this, When I come, will I find faith in the earth? Now, he didn't say, when I come, will I find the faith in the earth? Because that was promised on this rock. I will build my church. The faith is intact. What's not guaranteed is this, is living faith. Will I find people still trusting me? Will I find people still looking for my returning? You know, that's why he said, in the hour that you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Because the, the Spirit is in the modern day, is not to really believe He's coming. And, and, and so we find then uh, that we as the Lord's people, uh, it, when the victory occurs, just keep going, watch for trouble. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. What way? You know what? Every Sunday is not going to be Flapjack Sunday. You're not going to get a free hot meal come every Sunday. Some days are rough. Not every Sunday are you going to leave out of here going, Woo! It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Now we should, but you know I'd be lying if I said we did. Because you and I have both left in a different situation. And you know what? I'm not going to paint you a pretty picture. You'll leave that way again sometime. Because it's just not guaranteed. Now, I will say this. Nine-tenths of the time, we bring it on ourselves because we've never prepared before we got here. And, and, and so, but, you know, again, you're going to get discouraged because of the way. Now, they had seen victory, but the road is still rough. They had seen a great accomplishment, but things were uh, still difficult. That's why, listen, these health and wealth people, uh, such as Osteen, you can mark them off your list, and I'll even go further. Billy Graham goes with him, and uh, uh, you know what? Uh, things are not going to wax better. The Bible says things will wax worse and worse. It's not going to be an easy way. We're not going to have fun every day that comes. We're not going to be enjoying because of the way. What about you? You know what? If you enjoy every day of, of this filthy, stinking world out there, there's a spiritual problem with you. The way ought to be rough for us. The way ought to be difficult because that's what got them discouraged. 
And the foe pe and the soul of the people were much discouraged because of the way the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And you know what? In the modern day, people don't like truth. They, they just don't. We, we've gotten so used to, they don't like the basics. You know what the basics is? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the basics. Now, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, Him crucified and risen again. That, that, that's some basic stuff. You know what? People don't necessarily like that anymore. What about you? Uh, you know what? It's some basic things that we need to that we need to embrace as the Lord's people. So they were getting bread; they just didn't like what they got. And we live in a day and age today where people are getting something; they just don't like what they get. And, and, and that that is really not a not a lack of provision from God. And what it is is a preference. What 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 you like physically, and so they were upset with the man of God. Verse 6, and the Lord, notice that, and the Lord, not Moses, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of Israel died. Now, if you want to respect God this morning, you commit that one to memory, because when you rebel against God, and you know what rebelling against God is? Rebelling against God's man. When, when that happens, the fiery serpents are coming. And you know what? It might be the hand of the Lord to send them for real. But you know what? It might just be... Remember Miriam and her big mouth? She was a leper. Right? Until Moses interceded for her. Just talked about Ahab. Wasn't he the one that got his arm blocked like this? I think he, uh, it was also looked leprous. leprous. And you know why? <laughs> and even then, God, God intervened. I think Elijah healed him. See, th 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 this is the thing. Uh, don't blame God's man if he's telling you the truth and, <laughs> and you don't like it if something happens. If you don't like it and you get sick, oh well. If you don't like it, and, 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 uh, and, and you become very sick, don't blame God's man. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people, and much, much people of Israel died. Therefore the, the people came to Moses and he said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us, and Moses prayed for the people. Now, I think it's very interesting. It says that he prayed for the people. It does not say that he prayed that the serpents would go away. You know what? You get out and sin, I'm going to pray for you. But it's not my responsibility to pray, remove the judgment hand of God. In fact, I won't do it. Now, I believe He will. But you know what? That's in the hands of the Almighty God. Sometimes what you need to pray for is just perseverance. You know, the uh, problem with this flesh is this. We're not happy anywhere. We're really not. If you want to be in Clarksville, you get to Clarksville, you want to be back at Bumpus Mail. You get to Bumpus Mail, you're not satisfied with Bumpus Mail, you want to get to Dover. You get to Dover, not satisfied with Dover. You know what? We're just not satisfied people. I think that comes naturally uh, with the depravity of, of the flesh. Because you remember, Moses, I mean, Adam and Eve could have anything but two fruits. And that's the ones they wanted. That, 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 is, that is the natural condition of man. And so we must be uh, very, very cautious of that. Very, very, very careful about that in our own lives. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that, it, that if a serpent had bitten any man, 
and he beheld the serpent of the brass, he lived. You know what? That's a pretty amazing thing for Moses to learn. That, that's a pretty amazing thing. He, he was obedient to God and he put the serpent up there uh, and anybody that looked on it was healed. They, they'd been bitten by the snake. They'd been bitten by evil. They'd been bitten by sin. But if they looked into the very image of sin, then they were saved. That, that, that's beyond a, You know what? When, when Moses was received that idea, if he looked at it in the carnality, if he'd not been a spiritual man, you know what he would have thought? That's stupid. But he believed God. He believed what God had to say. He believed in the promises that the Lord had left. And so he very obediently did exactly what he was told. And when we do that as Lord's people, when we follow through with exactly as we're commanded, the Lord is going to bless. See, he learned by experience. You know what? That's experience he took the rest of the way with him. When I, I remember when the, you know what? And they kept, the, they kept the brazen serpent. In fact, they had it to the point that they were worshiping it eventually. But you know what? That was a token. They, they remembered that. Uh, Moses learned by experience, and you will too. Moses learned by the events that happened in his life and seeing God's hand move time and time and time again. And he was always blessed for it. Go with me back to Exodus chapter 4. And we're going to read one more thing about Moses. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. Moses was now saved. He was given a great command to get the people out. Which seemed an impossibility in that day. It seemed an impossibility to him. And notice what he says in verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord. Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither henceforth, neither heretofore, nor since hast thou hast spoken unto my servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now I, w I want you to kind of get that because that that is very much what we do. Now uh, he was going to learn some great things about rebellion. You know what this really, really is about when he says, I'm slow of tongue and slow of speech? It's about rebellion. And, and, I, and I'll tell you how I see that. Aaron was never in the picture, picture to start with. Right. That, that was not God. You know what? Uh, I can't speak that well. But I don't have somebody up here speaking for me, do I? What you have to do is simply to believe God. So, you know, he would learn by experience, but here at the beginning, what was he doing? He was doubting God. Was he not? He, he didn't think Christ, the Lord was sufficient. He didn't think He was able. He did, and, and so he said, I'm slow of speech. I, I don't have a good dialect. I don't have a good ability. And you know, that's hard for me to believe to start with because he knew both Egyptian and Hebrew fluently. I don't think he was slow of speech. You know what I think it was? I think it was an excuse. Just a flimsy excuse. I've heard some preachers say, well, he had a speech impediment. The only problem that I have with that, it's not in the Bible. Right? And, and, and so he, uh, he, he makes his excuse unto the Lord, verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Now answer that. Who hath made your mouth? Who, who made your teeth and your gums and your tongue? He made it. So even if there was a defect, and I don't think there was, but just say for a moment there was, who made the defect? God. Yeah. Right? And, and so uh, it wasn't that, <laughs> that, that he had, had an excuse because God authored it all, and, and we need to remember that. And the Lord said unto him, Who made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or the deaf? Or the, or the seeing or the blind have not I the Lord. Now, uh, 
You know what? We, we look at those things as defects, don't we? If we had a child that was born <coughs> deaf, we would see that as punishment, would we not? And, and, and you, you know why I know that's true? Because even the apostle said, Who have seen him or his parents? And the Lord said, Not neither one of them, but for under the glory of God. Now, if he had this speech defect, it was for the glory of God. It was to show that despite defects, God will use them. Despite what we perceive as problems that God that God can overcome it, that He can create, that He can that He can stand and, and be victorious, even in that, that's what our God is able uh, is able and, and and ready to do. Verse twelve. Now therefore go, and who will be thy mouth? Therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. So who was the first choice to be to be the speaker? God. Now you can read the rest of that and Moses continues to rebel and he finally got mad and said, okay, you can have Aaron. But I want you to see what we need to depend on is God. And you know what? He, Moses had an issue with it the rest of his life. Why? Because he did not go with God's plan. And you know why you'll have difficulty in your life? is when you don't go with God's plan. You know what? God's plan for the home is one man, one woman, a pastor with kids, nothing else. Not two women, not four women, not two men and two women. That, that's what we are to go with. And we're to be blessed in it. So why in the modern day do we have so many different things going on? Well, I can tell you, it's because they don't believe God. They don't trust Him. They don't think He's there. Very same problem Moses had. But thank God through experience, Moses... <laughs> Learn to trust God. Remember when they were on the mountain and uh, <laughs> Moses said to God, I, I just want to see you face to face. And he says, You can't do that and live, but you can see my hinder parts. You know when you see somebody's hinder parts? When you're following them. And. <laughs> He said, you get in that cave, I'll pass by, I'll put my hand on you, and as I'm striding on, you can poke out see, and see my hinder parts. And you know what? <laughs> That's exactly what he did. See, we as the Lord's people, we ought to do, desire to know God and to follow Him carefully. To follow Him, not what, what men think, but what the Bible says. And, and, and let it be, let it be, let it stop there. Let it be enough. So this morning, I'll ask you to do your own self-evaluation. Um, do you want to see Him face to face? How, how well do you really want to know Christ? 